an important thing. Today, we draw a line in the sand and we go, oh my God, we've got a serious illness out there. Because if we don't take that message home today, we have a serious problem in Australia that's just going to be ignored. And more people are going to get sick, more people are going to die, and this is a really serious health issue. And I don't say this lightly, I see this similar to the AIDS epidemic. So, what is Lyme disease? Basically, you get bitten by a tick, this is classical, or a lice, a louse, or a bed bug, you can be envenomated with a whole pile of bacteria. Some of them may, some of these ticks may contain a virus called Lyme disease, which is a spirochete, a little wire-like bacteria, the most complex bacteria that we know. And lots of people in Australia get Lyme disease and tick bites, but most of them get it overseas. They go to Europe, they go to America, they go to Asia, and they get bitten by something, usually a tick, could be a louse, could be a bed bug. In some studies, unfortunately, it's mosquitoes. That is really scary. And they come back to Australia and they're sick. And they, they, their disease is not recognised here. And they don't get tested properly. They don't get treated properly. And eventually they end up being abandoned. And I can tell you there are thousands of strains with this. Probably tens of thousands. We don't know. Because we don't even collect the numbers. We don't even make the diagnosis. And then if you're a doctor like me, I've been treating this disease for 20 years. And we get abused. We told them we're all mad. These patients are all mad. They just need a psychiatrist. They're very sick. And this is a, not just a medical issue, it's a political issue. Because denialism is a fact. So, facts. Lyme disease is the fastest growing tick-borne illness in the world. Okay? 300,000 Americans catch this every year from ticks. Deer ticks, 0.01% of the population. But, in 20 years of knowing work, and particularly with the research that's coming out now, it's sexually transmitted. Okay? It's congenitally transmitted from mothers to babies. And I think it's contaminating our blood service, our blood transfusion service. Just like AIDS did. I was an AIDS doctor, so I know about this. I saw all the young people dying. I can tell you, this is the same. And in Australia, we have all the ticks available to carry this organism. The problem lies to some extent because we haven't actually found the organism except in one tick of one echidna. But I know now that there will be other ticks found with this organism because I see people getting bitten in Australia as well who develop the same illness that people have got in overseas. And at the moment, in the last five years, my group of doctors, I'm the president of ACIDS, Australian Chronic Infectious and Inflammatory Disease Society, and we've treated over 4,000 patients. Okay? 4,000 patients. We're currently treating 1,500 patients, and we have all have thousands of people writing to us, ringing us up. If I do this, you see me on television, I'll have 300 phone calls a day. People wanting to see me. We have an epidemic out there that's silent, except for those who suffer it and the carers. And there's tens of thousands, I believe, of people with it, but we have no idea of the numbers. Now, the problem for this and the political impact of this is it's going to cost money. There's a logarithmic increase in health care, hospital care. This is going to cost this country a lot of money if we don't get this under control. Because if it's sexually transmitted, congenitally transmitted in our blood service, we'll have no control of it. We might be able to control the ticks and tick bites, but there's another other epidemic starting to happen. Okay, who am I? In 1976, I was a med student. I went to Papua New Guinea. I worked in Alatau. And I treated TB and leprosy. I was only there for four to six months, saw all these people. But the standard treatment was two to five years rotational antibiotics. And these people were really sick. They were local people. They deserved treatment. They got treatment. In 1978, I graduated and directed myself into intensive care medicine. But I realised after a couple of years of that, I went into isolated rural general practice and worked in rural practice until 1996. And I spent five years in the third world. So I saw everything. I've seen chronic diseases, I've seen epidemics, I've seen all sorts of things in my career. But in 1983, I was a country doctor in a place called Ballinger, and I started to see AIDS patients. Now, we didn't know what it was. People had funny bugs, they were really sick, they had infection, they were immunosuppressed, and they gradually died. And then by the late 90s, early, or late 80s, early 90s, we had a diagnosis, we knew it was a virus. We started to develop drugs to treat it. So I moved out of that area because that, was actually, that epidemic was actually brought under control. There was a health, remember the bowling ball? 
a grim reaper. Well, maybe we need a bowling ball. I don't know. In 1997, I changed my whole focus of practice to chronic and complex disorders. So I've been treating chronic fatigue syndrome, treated about 3,500 people with chronic fatigue syndrome, and 600 of those patients have had Lyme disease since 1997. And I was sent my first patient from an infectious diseases specialist who said to me, Richard, I can only treat this patient for four weeks because that's what you do. Can you take over and I treated that patient for another two and a half years? And they got better. Okay? Four weeks, two and a half years. So, who's doing this for me? Do that? Just put on the slide. Now, this is a tick bite. Now, basically, a tick will get onto your skin, crawl up your pants, trapped it to you. It has a proboscis, really sharp. It will penetrate your skin, it will regurgitate its stomach contents with its whole plethora of bugs, viruses, parasites and beryllia. This is a beryllia here. And then this goes throughout your whole immune system, into your blood, into your body tissues, but your body, just repeat things, your body doesn't mount an immune response against it. And that's part of the problem with this organism. It's immunosuppressive and then can lay dormant. And because of the nature of the organism, most complex bacteria that we know, this can stay in your body for a long time. So if you don't get treated acutely, this turns into a chronic form. You might not even know you had a tick bite. Okay, so in America, this is diagnostic. Now I was on a plane this morning, I was sitting next to an American, and I was telling him I was going to talk on Lyme disease. He said, oh, I've had Lyme disease. I had a rash on my arm from a tick bite, I had a bullseye. I went down to the GP, he gave me six weeks of antibiotics, and I got better. Now this doesn't happen so much in Australia. Rarely do you see this bullseye rash. The tick bite's in the middle, the bullseye is rashes around it, because we have a different bug. They have brilliant ball gophorite, right? Type of Lyme disease, sense of stricter. They have their own type. We have a different type. I think it's going to be a relapsing fever beryllia, but we haven't really found it. We've only found one tick with one beryllia so far in Australia. We just have to look for more ticks, but we've got lots of sick patients. So I'm about the patients, not about the ticks. Eventually we'll work out the signs. Okay, so when patients come to me, I'm in a fortunate position because most patients have. They're already previously diagnosed, but often they've been misdiagnosed with all this. Chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, just muscle pain, can't sleep, whatever, severe fatigue, rheumatoid arthritis, but all the blood tests and imaging, but they've got big, hot, swollen joints. Sometimes they have multiple sclerosis, motor neuron disease, a fatal disease, Parkinson's disease, even Alzheimer's disease, even Pick's disease, young people with Alzheimer's, and really, and autism. Now we have this massive increase in autism. It used to be 3 in 10,000 people. Now it's 1 in 50 in America. It's 1 in 100 here. Pediatricians are sending patients with a diagnosis of autism, but they actually got Lyme disease. I'll show you a case shortly. In chronic pain syndrome, people have racking pain that they can't control. They're absolutely incredibly unwell, and they're told they're banging it off. They're psychiatric. There's nothing wrong with them. Well, they've got one of these terrible diseases, can't do much about it. Well, you're not responding to treatment, don't know what to do. And really, what they, all these things is the same thing. They've got Lyme disease or they've got co-infections. And that's really scary because if that's what most of the medical professionals diagnose, can't fix them, they get worse, they're not classic, they're a bit atypical, we've got a serious problem. Spiders. Now, this is a Borrelia bacteria. It's like a worm-like little... Bacteria is very small, but it's a very complex bacteria. <coughs> and it has the capacity to form this little bump on the top. Sorry, the slide's not so good, but that little bump is DNA. So when you kill this bug, it'll release the DNA elsewhere into the body, and it'll regrow another bug. And eventually, if you do it again, it goes into a little cyst. And if it goes to a cyst, it's inside your cell, and it's dormant. So it can sit there, one year, two years, three years, two, one decade, two decades, and then suddenly it starts to activate. This bug reproduces very slowly. Now, when you're killing bacteria, bacteria reproduce themselves very quickly. And that's why you can introduce an antibiotic, stop that reproductive cycle in the bacteria, get rid of the infection. This bug doesn't act that way. And it's everywhere. It goes into your muscles, your nerves, your blood, your joints, and in places where there's not much of an immune support, called a biofilm. Okay. Now, if you're lucky enough to someone say, oh, look, you could have Lyme disease, then we do the next wrong thing. We do an ELISA test. Now, an ELISA test is a screening test. Invariably in Australia, it's always negative. If you get an IgG, IgM negative ELISA, oh, you don't have Lyme disease, the test is negative. It's a wrong test. First line test should be Western blot test, which is just looking at the protein bands, and you get a 
an analysis and you get a few bands. And if you're in America, you need five bands. If you're in Scotland, you need three bands. All sorts of definitions for this. Or a polymase chain reaction test. Take some body fluid, joint fluid back from your spine, blood, urine, and actually find the DNA and match it to a known norm. Polymase chain reaction test. Those two tests should automatically, from today, be the paramount tests for diagnosing this disorder. Okay? Wrong test, right test. Okay, let's have a look at some patients. What do patients look like? Now, this young girl's in my clinic. Her name's Jennifer, and she's having a seizure. Now, she does this all day, every day. She's been, just keep repeating that once. She does this all day, every day, and she came to me with these seizures. She'd been bitten by a bed bug in Bali two years ago. Within a few weeks, she became sick and fatigued with joint pains and pain. And within weeks, she started to have tremors, and she was told she was psychiatric. Now, the history didn't support that. She's seen a colleague of mine. We've done the appropriate test in America, and she has Lyme disease, and she has some co-infections, infections associated with this disorder. And that's really serious. Now, she's like this. She's not having a fit. She's having a seizure. It's different. The EEG, the brain scans are abnormal, the EEGs are normal. So this doesn't fit into the way doctors think about this disease. Next slide, please. Now this young lady is Amanda Loren. Oh, no, sorry, we've gone too far. Go back one, try again. Okay, this is Amanda Loren. Now Amanda is in a nursing home. She's 31 years of age. She has congenital Lyme disease. She was born with it. She never left Australia. Her mother's got Parkinson's disease, and she's got this disease. And she's having one of these major seizures. She actually does have epilepsy as well. She's severely damaged. She's been in and out of institutions, told she's mad, bunging all this on. And really, she's got intense Lyme disease. Now, I've got her in Mossman Nursing Home. So Mossman Nursing Home. And she's already starting after eight months of antibiotics. We're getting her up walking. She stops having a seizure. The neurologist and I are working to get her out of hospital. She does have a child who seems to be well, but she is not well. But I think she will get her out of there. This is negligence of the extreme. Next patient. Next. So this is Talia Smith. Some of you may have heard of Talia. She's up near the Newcastle region. She was bitten by a chick seven years ago in Central Coast, New South Wales. Now, she was told that all these body movements, just keep repeating this when it finishes, um, was psychosomatic. She was bunging this on, 23 hours a day. She got down to 32 kilos. Her body was riddled with these bacteria. Lyme disease, Bartonella, Babesia, Rickettsia, all positive tests. We were treating her here in Australia but losing control. She was getting sicker and we put a tube into her stomach so we kept her alive by giving her intravenous feeds and feeding her through the gut. We sent her to a hospital. They took out all the tubes and said it's psychiatric. So we got her out of there because it's a dangerous place to be in hospital if you've got Lyme disease. And we sent her to Germany. Now, I know Friedrich Dowes and Lucy George Clint very well. I've been over there helping write their protocols. And she had treatments with hypothermia. We superheat the body to 41.7 degrees and we kill the bug with antibiotics while the temperature's high. And really it comes out of the cells. And one thing I haven't got here today on this slide, but I've actually got evidence. I can see the bacteria coming out of the cells because I have a video of her blood. Now, she's never left Australia. She's in the central coast. She has Lyme disease. And this is a denialism that's catastrophic. If the, if the stupidity of the medical profession is such, they can't see this as real, we have no hope medically. Okay? This is serious stuff. Now, she's had plasmapheresis, so we filled in her blood in Germany, and then she went to Switzerland and she's had stem cell therapy. And here she is today, in recovery, getting better. Still has co-infections, no brillia. I think the bartonella is gone. She's walking, she's having rehab, she's eating the tubes out of her stomach, she's put on weight. And she's a gorgeous young lady, and I can actually have a conversation. I've never had a conversation with her until we actually stopped the seizures and the fits. She had to go to Germany, spent hundreds of thousands of dollars. The parents, the community, the family paid, no hospital, no government support, nothing. These people are going bankrupt trying to save their daughter. And she's told she's psychiatric when she's got a really serious infection. This is negligence, absolute negligence by the medical profession. Laura France, young girl sent to me by a pediatrician, already diagnosed with Lyme disease. She had autism. So she had this young girl, very young. She had all these other symptoms though. She couldn't think. 
autistic spectrum disorder symptoms, but her gut didn't work. She had terrible pain, terrible headaches. And she was, mum remembers her, being bit by a tick. Pediatrician diagnosed her with Lyme disease. I treated her for 18 months with rotational low-dose antibiotics, and she's now better. She's top of the class. She's normal. She won't get this back again. I stopped it because she had appropriate treatment. Carl McManus. Now, those of you who know about the Carl McManus Foundation, that was founded after Carl died. Now, Carl was a patient of mine. He was bitten by a tick in Duffy's Forest. He developed symptoms within days. Within weeks, he was starting to lose his function in his limbs. No one knew what to do. He got sent to an infectious diseases specialist and said, okay, this could be Lyme disease, but it's not here in Australia, but we'll have a look. Got the classic four weeks of treatment of antibiotics. And then after four weeks, he's told he had to stop. Because that's what you do, that's what the evidence in America says. And for whatever reason, I think that's political and to do with insurance. So he progressed and I eventually saw it at the end of his life and unfortunately Carl passed away. But as a result of that, his legacy is we have the Carl McManus Foundation, which raises funds and does education processes and whatever to actually help people understand this illness. They fund this research at Sydney Uni, which I'm part of in the Tick-Borne Diseases Unit, to actually work out what's going on in Australia. So his death won't be forgotten. And this is Arwen Bryant. Now this is sad. This man was sent to me by an American colleague. All my patients now are referred to me because I'm at the top of the pile. I can't see new patients. I just take other patients that other docs don't know what to do. So he was sent to me by experts in America. He can move back to Australia. That's where he had family. He couldn't swallow. He had racked with body pain. His delay in diagnosis was years. Always been told he was mental, psychiatric, and unfortunately um, took his life. Now, I've had 17 of my patients die from this illness, and I can tell you, that's tough. And when they take their life, I feel like I failed them. You know, but the system failed. We didn't diagnose him. We didn't treat him enough. So, what's the view? How do you treat this? If I make a diagnosis, do the right test, take the right history, spend the time with the patient, I need to think that I'm going to take two to five years to get a better, not four weeks of antibody. That's a nonsense. That's for acute Lyme disease in America. Now, the IDSA um, guidelines in America have just been dismissed. Now we follow what we call ILADS guidelines, which are akin to our ACIDS guidelines. This group of doctors that we've set up, GPs, to treat this illness. Because we have a serious healthcare issue out there. Treat them with supportive therapy, so we're doing diets and supplements and physios and psychologists to help the family, help the family, trying to get Funding, how do you fund this? Do you get them on a pension? How do you get them on a pension? I can tell you, every step is a battle. Oh, Lyme disease doesn't exist, you can't have that, we can't give you any money. Long-term rotational antibiotics. IV, oral, extremely important. It helps them get better, but as you can see, you've got to do then rehabilitation, you've got to get them moving again, you've got to get the psychiatry, their psychiatric issues, their psychology improved, because they're damaged. They haven't been to school, they haven't formed relationships, they haven't learned anything. So if they're a child, you've got a really serious problem. But look, I find the community and families are great with this, but we're abandoned and we're alone. The doctors are alone, <coughs> the patients are alone. So unless you've got a supportive family, you'll end up like a band of in in the nursing home that I'm looking after with a group of geriatric nurses. Now, and these treatments overseas that I talked about, hypothermia, stem cell. There's a hypothermia unit at Prince of Wales Hospital in mothballs. No one is going to do this treatment here. We can do this treatment here. We just need some intelligent, capable, intensive care people. That's what they are in Germany. And this could be true. I'm sure stem cell therapy can be learned. They're willing to come and teach us. We haven't got to base one. We haven't recognised the illness. And if we've got this illness developing, we need to tell people about it. Bowling ball, bowling over ticks, I don't know. But we need to tell people, if you get bitten by a tick, you've got a problem. You may have one of these diseases. You need to tell people there's ticks in this area. People need, need to wear appropriate clothing. How do you cover up? What do you do if you find a tick? How do you actually feel sick after a tick? Should you see a GP? How long should you take the antibiotics for if you do take antibiotics? What if you see a doctor who doesn't believe in this? You go to another doctor. Or, and if this stuff has got to come from above, this is a political problem. The medical profession is not capable of making the right decision at this time. So. I'm pleading with you, everybody in Australia, in this House of Representatives, in the Senate, 
to take some political leadership because this is wrong. This is just like AIDS. I saw the beginning of AIDS and I can tell you it's exactly the same. The political recognition of Lyme disease in Australia has to happen now. It's an oh my god moment. This guy's telling me we've got a problem. We didn't know we had this problem. We better have a think about it. So rather than just, oh, just another meeting and go off somewhere, this is a serious problem. Tens of thousands of people are sick. The medical leadership has to come from the Minister of Health, the Chief Medical Officer, the Chief Pathologist, and for you as individuals to go and talk to them. Encourage this leadership to take this on. Because otherwise we're going to have a serious problem that's going to just encompass Australia, cost our health system an enormous amount, cause an enormous amount of suffering, and people are going to die. And if it's sexually transmitted, congenitally transmitted, and in our blood service, we have a serious problem. And I can tell you, the science is there. We just put it into the Senate inquiry in our submission for Masson. It's about a thousand pages long with all the scientific backup we put in it. The evidence is there, so you need to take note. And the doctors who treat this, the patients who have this, need to be supported politically. And the influence you have will make a difference to them. Because otherwise, like all these patients I've shown you today, they're all abandoned. It's only because of the goodwill of the families and they love their children or they love their partner. They want to get them well. But, you know, at the moment, there's a little bit of support by the, from the government in maybe pensions and things, but there's no recognition of the illness. So we have to start at the top. So we need to filter down to the medical vision and say, stop, you, you've got it all wrong, you've got to think differently. The science is there, it's just denial is, and it pervades every hospital, almost every doctor. As John was saying, it's boring. I can tell you it's boring to go to conferences and give talks online, and I say, oh, it doesn't exist, there's no evidence of it. That's nonsense. You just have to find the ticks with it in, but we've got plenty of patience with it. So, oh my God, mate, draw a line into sand. Today's the day that we actually change our thought about this disease, like HIV, and we actually do something about it instead of giving it lip service. Thank you.